fine Chinaman here, and today we have quite a treat for you. So there's a lot of confusion when it comes to uh, sterling silver or flatware in general with all the little individual pieces that can be at a place setting. A lot of times back 100 years ago, uh, tables were much more elaborate than they are today. Many of us still like to collect those older sets and be able to use those rarer pieces for fine dinners. But what are they for and what are they? So I'm hoping to run a series here, starting today, with going through the pieces and seeing what each piece is. To do this, I've asked a friend of mine to join us today. His name's Trenton. He has a huge background in um, sterling silver and uh, fine dinnerware. Trenton, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, welcome to the Fine Chinaman channel. Well, I'm, I'm honored to be asked and thank you very much. Uh, I'm Trenton. I have worked in tabletop retail for about 47 years. I was fortunate enough to have a first job with Tiffany and Company in the Atlanta branch. In those days, uh, there, were, there were six Tiffany branches in the country and um, it was a very personal business and you got to know the buyers. I started in, in those days, the branches were divided into front rooms and back rooms. The back rooms were very fancy with the very expensive jewelry. The front room was, I think, equally fancy with china, crystal, and silver. Uh, Tiffany at the time was owned by Walter Hoving, and Mr. Hoving was a great merchant and was a very opinionated man. And Tiffany was only going to kill, sell sterling silver. And you could have anything in your, your house to set the table with as long as it was sterling. But in China and Crystal, he had a much wider range of things. In the late 70s, when I started, um, they sold an $8 wine glass, which is was mar, mar, perfect balloon crystal glass. Um, and you would also had the most expensive or the most the finest Baccarat and Valse Lambert in the crystal. And in China, they carried um, uh, Royal Crown Derby, an incredible line of exclusive to Tiffany called Tiffany Private Stock, which um, was extraordinary. I had the pleasure of actually seeing that made in an atelier in France by Monsieur Le Telec. Uh, where there were about 12 women in a little room carefully painting these incredible patterns. And he developed those um, under the direction of um, the design director of Tiffany's at the time, who was Bande Truex. Um, that is a whole nother YouTube channel on Mr. Truex, who before Walter Hoving hired him, uh, designed the Parsons table. He was brilliant. Uh, at Tiffany's, I was able to just see the very best of curated um, china, crystal, and silver, and learned how to set the table the way Tiffany wanted it. Um, then after I left Tiffany's, I was very fortunate to get what I call my good job. Uh, there was a great entrepreneur in Atlanta named Beverly Bremer. She started her business um, out of necessity and sold two sets of flatware in the Atlanta, in an Atlanta flea market, which was a brilliant flea market. It was centrally located. It had great parking and it was open every weekend. Um, flea markets today travel around and are not as, uh, as consistent. And Beverly had her people who would visit her every weekend and she would sell Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then the rest of the week, she would find things. Um, and she was brilliant, had a great eye. The flea market closed. She opened a free standing uh, store in a strip shopping center. Um, and, and eventually after I, Tiffany, she hired me and I was there for 34 years. Um, saw extraordinary pieces of silver coming through there, but Beverly took the same amount of care uh, for a salt spoon, which we're not going to talk about tonight, 
as she did for a $40,000, $50,000 centerpiece. Uh, and we took care of our customers that way. And when the time came after me, Beverly's daughter, and um, inherited the business, we ran it great for about eight more years. And like a lot of things, it was time for us to, uh, to move on. Um, it was about eight months after Jean's Silversmith, which was an icon in Manhattan, had closed after 110 years. We didn't quite match that, that length of time, but um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. Well, thank you. Trent. Good. Thank you, Trenton. Um, yeah, I have to say, uh, Beverly Bremer uh, Silver Shop, in my opinion, was uh, the best of the best as far as silver offerings uh, in the U.S. And it's a sad thing that uh, that that had to go, but time does march on, as as we all know. And and it is it is it is sort of sad, but it's it's okay. Uh, yeah, we we when. Mimi and her brother and sister, and the three of them had inherited the business. Um, it was time. No one is getting any, any younger. Uh, Mimi showed me the um, lease, the number of years the landlord wanted to extend the lease. And he's more optimistic about my health than my doctor is. So uh, I don't think I was going to live quite that long. That's a little facetious, but only a little. Uh, you know, it's it's time, and in these at these times, you you had to make they had to make the decision, and it was um, went out on flying colors. And we, I mean, I think you and I met over the phone during that uh, time when we were closing up uh, yeah. for that. Yeah. And now we get to talk about the excitement of spoons. Yes. So let me show everybody this picture here. Now, this is in no way, shape, or form all the spoons that are out there. What we have today is a, a picture here that represents uh, basic, in a sense, teaspoons with a little bonus at the end. Now, when you look at this picture, the biggest spoon at the end is not an oval soup. Some of you will just think that off because everything, it's hard to tell scale in a picture. You'll say, oh, that's an oval soup spoon. That's not an oval soup spoon. So we're going to go through these spoons, uh, these basic spoons. So let's take an up-close look at the first spoon. Uh, this pattern, by the way, is Lucerne by Wallace. It was first introduced in 1896 and ran for 100 years approximately till 1996 uh, when it ceased production. This first spoon is six inches long. Trenton, what is this spoon for? That is a teaspoon. That is a, the spoon you would use to stir coffee and tea and a design director at Tiffany and Company named George O'Brien came to town one day and he told me, Trenton, you put out the teaspoon when there's a teacup and saucer on the table for a luncheon or for breakfast. And then when you're, if you're serving coffee after dinner in a coffee cup, bring the teaspoon in. My mother was appalled, but she eventually was convert, con, uh, converted. Um, it is basically designed to do that. Now, if you're a man of a certain age, as I am, um, the teaspoons were often used to serve, to eat exotic desserts like Libby's canned fruit cocktail. Um, but that was not its original purpose. Basically, just to stir the coffee and the cream and sugar in the coffee or tea. Period. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you, Trent. Mr. O'Brien left a very uh, firm impression, and I believe the thought of termination of employment, if he ever saw a teaspoon on a formal table setting, was mentioned. But um, I'm not real sure about that. So, if you wanted the if you wanted the teaspoon there, you had just had to put out a cup and saucer as well. Exactly, exactly. And that 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 was, of course, Mr. O'Brien's decision, and I believe he is no longer with us. And um, if I've ever been a guest in anyone's house, I have never corrected the table setting. Okay. My mother raised me a little bit better than that. Yes, of course. Okay, well, let's look at our next spoon because this is going to be uh, even um, more unique here. So now we have a spoon that's not always available, but this one is a little smaller. It measures five inches approximately. 
Uh, what is this spoon for then? It is called variously an afternoon teaspoon or an after dinner teaspoon. And that was made smaller so that when people were having a formal tea or a coffee and they were not drinking the beverage at the table, they were holding the teacup and saucer in their hand, the smaller spoon rested in the saucer easier. It did not fall out, it balanced better. Same purpose, stirring coffee and uh, stirring sugar and cream in the coffee or sometimes just to cool down the coffee. Um, but that was that was basically it and um, causing lots of confusion because they don't really do teas as much as they used to or ever. Um, but that was the purpose. And why did they make the afternoon teaspoons? <clears throat> because they could. Um, they could could make them and they could sell them. And that was what they were. They were in business to make money. And at the last quarter of the 19th century, people entertained at home and they wanted to do the right thing and the right way. And having these pieces um, was a way to show how you knew how to do. All right, so um, I have heard this spoon also called a five o'clock teaspoon. Can you shed a little light on that as well? Exactly. Uh, the terminology varies, and I've never quite figured out why it changes, uh, except that the merchants who were selling these pieces would often um, call it, an, you know, a small teaspoon. Well maybe it's not selling let's call it an afternoon teaspoon or an after dinner teaspoon um the different names same piece um it just same purpose it just sounds sounds more interesting like um you can call um forks you know different things uh serving pieces different different names and it's more appealing to the customer by the between the two world wars um things had some settled down things were much more um regimented and the makers had decided that we're going to call it this we're not going to change the name of this again uh, you can see old catalogs and in a 10 year period, you can see two different names or three different names for different pieces. The easiest way to add to a piece, if you've inherited a set or if you're starting a set, is simply to measure them. The ruler is your friend. All right. Same piece can be called different things, but if it's five inches long, afternoon teaspoon, after dinner coffee spoon, it's the same. Okay. Well, then that brings us to our next when we're, we're sizing down on these as we go. If you look at our next piece here, this is even a smaller spoon measuring in at four and a fourth inch. Mm -hmm. uh, what is this spoon for then? That is a demi tasse spoon. And I'm going to sort of, if I can, skip ahead. I'm not going to mess up the, the, the ending, but... Lucerne produced two sizes of demi tasse spoons. They're both demi tasse spoons for after dinner coffee. It was very exciting at the turn of the 20th century. Turkish coffee was very strong, served in after dinner coffee uh, cups. Um, this was never about caffeine, it was never about a web um, a wi, wi Fi connection. It was about communi it was about talking to people. It was about gracious entertaining. You did not invite somebody to your home because they were thirsty or hungry. It was to have a lovely dinner and to talk about interesting subjects. And to do that after dinner, coffee would be served and they would have the demi tasse spoons. Uh, often demi tasse spoons will have a gilded bowl to it, a Vermeer bowl. Vermeer was um, a 17th or 18th century method in France to copy the solid gold that the king would eat off of. 
Um, it does not react to things to admit to, to food as many as other things do. Um, but it's attractive and it's, it's purely aesthetic. Uh, and that's sort of the demi spoon. Now I have seen people today use demi spoons for podocrem, um, to, to feed babies and, uh, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so let me put the other picture of the smaller Dimitas up, the next one, so everybody can see. This one measured in at four inches. Right. Now, if you look closely at it, it's not just the length. Also, the bowl size is a little different, too. Other than just two sizes, is there any reason they did that, or is it just different times? The, uh, are you talking about the last spoon with the round bowl? No, no, I'm talking about the uh, four and a quarter versus the four inch Dimitas. Um, okay, they did it because they could. I, I, I've, I've never, um, and most folks would have either in a set, uh, possibly, and this is just, I won't say guessing, but presuming if you were using it as at a less formal occasion, you might go with a demi spoon without the vermeil, um, but it just gave people an option. Possibly your China set had a larger demi tasse cup where the four inch wouldn't work work as well. Uh, okay. So fine. that gave people a little bit of a flexibility. Also, it's quite possible, and I have no way of documenting this. Uh, when, when flat silver was made, the steel dies were very expensive to produce. And it is conceivable that sometime in its production, one of the dies broke and they replaced it with a different die at a different size. I don't, I don't know that to be true. I know that to be possible. All right. Okay, well, thank you. So this, um, I'm sure everybody's learned quite a bit already. Now, this last spoon though is gonna be the most amazing one of the day in my opinion. So let's show this one. This one also measures in at four, but as Trenton was saying, its bowl is round. So Trenton, what is this spoon for? Well, this is when we should probably have a contest, but I don't have any presents to give out. So even though it is Christmas, um, that is a chocolate spoon. And it was designed for, uh, to serve hot chocolate and hot chocolate, the chocolate would often, um, go to the bottom of the the uh the cup and you could stir it up or you could actually eat the the chocolate that settled down at the bottom of the of the chocolate cup um and they also made a long handled stirrer that also was round and there are chocolate pots available you'll see them more in china than silver you don't see many American made silver chocolate pots. It's much more of a continental uh, form and especially um, popular in England in the 18th century. And, you know, in the turn of the 19th century, we were still copying England and trying to um, mimic or take that take a lead from the continent uh, because of the laws in the United States. We had a whole lot more freedom than they do in terms of produ producing things, which gets into mixed metals and a whole other things. Uh, but the chocolate spoon was, was really unusual. Uh, they are hard to come by. Um, and um, nowadays you can use it for hot chocolate or for a little photogram. Uh, I've even seen people do it for an appetizer course. Um, and they're, they're just, they're really, as Southern ladies said, they're just so charming. I love them. So nice pieces. Yes, I understand from, uh, I did a little research myself on the chocolate and uh, my understanding is they used to make it differently than how you have hot chocolate now. So there were actually chunks that would settle down at the bottom, which makes the chocolate spoon make even more sense. And the choc the price of chocolate was so much higher back then, it was considered quite a luxury. You wouldn't want to waste it. Exactly. And it was um, 
you know, after you've had a, you know, a multi-course meal, you, Lord knows you were, couldn't go home hungry, but um, it was just the right, the last, most, it was interesting and a different way to do that. I'm sure people wonder if the chocolate was served after or, bef or before the demitasse coffee or instead of, I don't know. Well, thank you so much for this. Now, there's so many more pieces out there. Um, we didn't even cover the soup spoons today or anything like that. And there's some other specialty spoons as well. Plus there's many different types of forks, knives, all these different things. Trenton, would you be willing to come back and do another video with some more pieces? Absolutely, I'd love to. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll plan on that uh, and we'll get another video up maybe in a month or so we'll get back together and uh, we'll do some more pieces for you guys. Well, thank you so much, Trenton, for joining us. If anybody has any questions or looking for pieces of silver, can they contact you? Absolutely. Um, I have an email address. It's info at Trenton, the number four silver.com. That's Trenton for silver.com. And I will endeavor to um, be of service to you. Um, Beverly said, I can't help anybody, but I can serve you. And I'm happy, happy to do that. And I have one other thing. I love working retail, but I also sing in a church choir. And I'm looking forward to singing a Christmas, two Christmas Eve services when I will not be exhausted to start with. I'll be exhausted by 1 a.m., but I won't start exhausted. So it's good. And I hope everybody has a Merry Christmas. Yes, everybody. Have a happy, merry Christmas. Take care, and we'll see you in the next video.